or negotiating while holding hostages. We are not going to negotiate while you're holding hostages. There are two parts to that sentence. May I have one minute to conclude? I see that Senator Portman has arrived. Without objection. The majority leader has said publicly he'll negotiate on anything and everything as soon as the hostages are released and the Tea Party shutdown is ended. To now blame the majority leader for this Tea Party shutdown reminds me of when President Lincoln was put in such a position. When President Lincoln was accused of the very thing he was trying to prevent. That is cool, he said. A highwayman holds a pistol to my ear and mutters through his teeth, stand and deliver or I shall kill you and then you will be a murderer. That was Abraham Lincoln. I yield the floor. The Senator from Ohio. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Madam Chair, we find ourselves uh, here in Washington uh, with the government shutdown in place and a debt limit approaching. And uh, I read this morning in the newspaper that a senior White House official has said with regard to the shutdown, and I quote, we are winning. It doesn't really matter to us how long it lasts. Um, that's not the right attitude. Today I call upon the White House to stop the political posturing, uh, come to the table so we can find common ground and end this government shutdown and, and negotiate something sensible on the debt limit. This notion that a senior White House official would say we are winning, it doesn't really matter to us how long it lasts, shows that it's politics, not substance, that matters. It may not matter to the White House how long it lasts, by the way, but it does matter to the American people because they expect us to fulfill our constitutional duties, to get our work done, uh, not to take America to the brink. They expect us to do the job that we were sent here to do. It matters, by the way, to a lot of Americans, too, that they're being affected by it. There are 8,700 civilian employees at Rice-Patterson Air Force Base outside of Dayton, Ohio, uh, who are being affected. Uh, it matters to the roughly 1,800 Ohio National Guardsmen across the state of Ohio who have been furloughed. So uh, we can stand here and we can point fingers at each other as to how we got here. Uh, the truth is that how we got here is that uh, we didn't do our work. The fact that we have a continuing resolution at all, which is a continuation of funding from last fiscal year, is a mark of failure. It's a mark of failure because it means that the Congress didn't do its appropriations bills that it's supposed to do. There are 12 of them. And the idea is that Congress sits down and has hearings about the agencies and departments to provide proper oversight to the federal government. And then they put together appropriations bills in 12 different areas. Uh, that hasn't happened. Congress is not passing these appropriations bills in an orderly way. If they did, there wouldn't be a continuing resolution. Uh, we can talk about the fact that over the last four years, under the leadership of the majority here in the United States Senate, we have passed exactly one appropriation bill out of 48 on time. One out of 48. That was the military construction bill. I think it was about 2011. Uh, that should be a relatively easy one to pass. Uh, the House has done better. They have passed more appropriations bills. They have passed a budget consistently every year. This year, in the fourth year after three years of no budget, the Senate did pass a budget, and I applaud the Senate for that. Uh, I do support going into conference with those budgets. But the fact is that Congress has not done its work, and that's why we're here. Only one appropriation bill out of 48 in the last four years has passed the Senate on time. One. There is another way to get around this, and we can talk about that. There is legislation called the Un End Government Shutdown Bill, which simply continues funding from year to year if you get to September 30th and any appropriation bill is not done. And what it says is same level of funding as the previous year, except after 120 days there's a 1% reduction in funding, another 60 days another 1% reduction in funding, 
and so on. And the reason is you want to encourage the appropriators to actually meet and get their work done, so you put a little inducement in there. That legislation is bipartisan. That legislation uh, we actually voted on here in the chamber earlier this year. It was supported by 46 of the 100 members. It was supported by every Republican except two. And it was supported by three Democrats. Uh, we tried to bring this up. It's my legislation. We tried to bring this up as an amendment last week on the continuing resolution. It would have made all the sense in the world. Instead of us having this discussion we're having now in the context of a government shutdown, if we had passed the end government shutdown amendment to the CR last week, we would be continuing funding from last year, knowing that it was going to be reduced by 1% in 120 days, which gives us plenty of time to get the appropriations together, and then another 1% for 60 days, another 1% after the next 60 days. We wouldn't be sitting here today in this situation with government shutdown had we passed that. The majority refused to allow that amendment to even come up for a vote. I don't know if we could have passed it or not. Again, we got 46 of us to support it last time. And my sense is, given the fact that we were heading toward a government shutdown, we could have gotten a majority of this body supporting that. But we don't know, because as is the case so often, uh, the leadership here blocks amendments, so we never had the opportunity to have our voices be heard as senators. So look, without a doubt, there's plenty of blame to go around. But whatever brought us to this point, it's where we are. And I can promise you this, as long as the White House and the majority in this chamber continue to refuse to talk about it, <laughs> to refuse to negotiate, as long as they refuse to attempt to find common ground, any common ground, uh, we're not going to make progress. As long as they treat it as a political opportunity, one to score political points, then we're not going to be able to move forward. It's a failure of leadership because governing is about talking, negotiating, discussing, debating, and then finding common ground. It's hard, but it's what we're hired to do. We talk a lot in this chamber about this notion of finding common ground, and I support it strongly, and we don't do it enough, but to find common ground, you've got to step off your own territory and onto some territory in the middle. That requires negotiations sitting down with both parties and talking. Uh, it's what the American people, by the way, want us to do. They do it in their lives every day. We do it in our marriages, don't we, and in our businesses. Uh, and yet, you have this unbelievable quote this morning I talked about of some senior official at the White House saying, we are winning, it doesn't matter to us how long it lasts. And as important to me, we have here in this chamber legislation coming over from the House that says, let's have a conference. That's the conference between the House and the Senate. So you have a formal process where we name conferees over here, people to represent the Senate, Republican and Democrat. The House names Republicans and Democrats. They come together and they discuss, in this case, the continuing resolution and the debt limit. And that was tabled here. In other words, the majority here did not want to move to conference, so they blocked it. That seems to me to be the wrong approach. Let's have a conference. Let's have a discussion. And by the way, this is on top of a hardline position that the president himself has taken. And I've talked about this over the last month because the president's been saying it for the last month. He has refused to discuss, refused to talk about, refused to negotiate on the debt limit. And again, that's coming up in only a couple of weeks. And as important as the government shutdown debate is, in my view, the debt limit discussion is even more important because it, it puts our country's economy at risk. Uh, I don't think that we should be taking a position on anything that we don't talk, but certainly not on the debt limit discussion. And the irony, which has been pointed out by others, is here you have a president of the United States that says he will negotiate with President Putin of Russia, but he won't talk with the Speaker of the House, who's in the other party. Uh, to me, it's irresponsible, it's a failure of leadership, and I don't think it's sustainable. I hope it's not. And by the way, the President has said he refuses to talk about the debt limit because we should just extend the debt limit without any preconditions, without any reduction in spending, without any discussion even. 
of what should go along with a debt limit extension. That, my friends, is just not consistent with the historical precedent either. Every president, Republican, Democrat alike, has engaged in negotiations, discussions about the debt limit, in part because, frankly, the debt limit's a hard vote. You know, folks I represent back home, they get it. It's, you know, for them, kind of like the credit card. Their, their deal is, okay, Congress has once again gone over the limits on the credit card. Got to be careful which credit card I hold up here. I'm not advertising for any particular one. This happens to be a MasterCard. But they're saying, you know, before you guys extend the limit on the credit card, let's deal with the underlying problem. It's kind of like if your teenager puts you as a parent in a position of having gone over the line on the credit card. We have some teenagers among us here today. I'm sure you've never done that. Your parents would probably say, after they rip up the credit card, you know, let's get at this underlying problem, which is the spending problem. What's wrong? Why are we spending more than we're taking in to the point that we have to keep extending the limit on this credit card? So the American people get it. And that's why every president, Republican or Democrat alike, has had to come up to Congress and say, okay, how are we going to work together to extend this debt limit while also dealing with the underlying problem, which is the fact that we're spending too much. And this president refuses to do it. I've gone back and looked. For the past three decades, the debt limit discussion is the only thing, the only thing that has led to Congress doing anything substantial on spending. Now, this is a period at which Congress has consistently spent more than it's taken in. Congress and the presidents, Republican and Democrat alike, have led the country into deficits and debts. We're now at historic levels. The debt this year is over $17 trillion. You know, we were in uncharted territory. So this year it's higher than ever, and yet this president is saying that unlike other presidents, he refuses to even talk about it. I'll tell you what's happened. Over the last 30 years, every substantial deficit reduction has come in the context of a debt limit debate. Some of you remember Graham Rudman back in the 80s. It was considered historic legislation at the time when we had much smaller deficits and a much smaller debt, but it provided rescissions across the board spending cuts. It was bipartisan. It came out of a debt limit discussion. In 1990, when President Bush, President George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush went out to Andrews Air Force Base with Republicans and Democrats alike to negotiate a budget agreement. It was in the context of a debt limit discussion. The PAYGO rules that many Democrats now talk about favorably came out of a discussion about the debt limit. The 1997 balanced budget agreement with Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton that ended up leading to the balanced budget that we got a couple years later came out of a discussion about the debt limit. Most recently, of course, the Budget Control Act came out of a discussion about the debt limit. So this notion that presidents never talk about or negotiate on the debt limit is just not accurate in terms of our history. In fact, just the opposite is true. It's the only time we've been able to reduce spending. I see the distinguished majority leaders on the floor, so I'll be, I'll be short, Madam President. Just to say that we need to figure out how to come together. The President needs to engage. It's time to govern. If the President refuses to talk, we won't be able to come to an agreement. If he does engage, as history has shown us, tough decisions can be made. I've gone through a litany of times when we have done it. I have also talked about the fact that this year we have a bigger debt than ever, a bigger deficit than any of those historical examples I gave, therefore a greater need than ever for us to come together and find that common ground. If, if the senator would, would yield for a moment, I think the, the distinguished majority leader is, is going to uh, make a procedural uh, motion which will take only a moment and then I'd I have a question for my distinguished friend. Happy to you. I ask you, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent. Pray for morning business be extended to 5 p.m. today. 
that all provisions of the previous order remain in effect. Without objection. And I appreciate my two friends for yielding for this consent agreement. Well, I, I think the distinguished... The, the senator from Mississippi. Thank you. And, and uh, it, Madam President, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, my distinguished friend from Ohio can still have the floor. I, I only wanted to take a moment to congratulate him on his remarks uh, to observe that when it comes to budget matters, uh, he knows where he speaks uh, with not only a distinguished record in the House of Representatives and uh, a leader in, in um, being a budget hawk and an opponent of additional debt in the House of Representatives and then a distinguished career uh, in, the, in the Office of Management and Budget. So I, I thank the distinguished gentleman. Uh, it, it may be that he has already asked for uh, an opinion piece from today's Wall Street Journal to be put into the record. I have not. Uh, uh, it, I, I would ask, if I might, uh, Madam President, for uh, a, uh, an opinion piece written by Kevin Hassett and Abby McCloskey on page A23 of today's Wall Street Journal entitled, Obama Rewrites Debt Limit History. I'd ask that that be placed in the congressional record at this point. Without objection. And I thank you, uh, Madam President, because this article uh, points out in a, in a very detailed uh, uh, and annotated way a number of times when this Congress has made policy changes, important, far-reaching policy changes in connection with negotiations on the debt ceiling increase. And so uh, I, I would just join my friend from Ohio in saying that absolutely it is incumbent on this Senate, Republican and our friends on the Democratic side of the aisle, uh, members of the House of Representatives and the President of the United States, our Commander-in-Chief, once again to negotiate in good faith. The President may feel that we are entirely unreasonable in our position. And frankly, there have been times during my 19 years in the House and now in the Senate when I felt that the chief executive was completely wrong in his viewpoint on, on how we should address our national debt. But at no time, uh, in my recollection, have the parties been simply unwilling to, to sit down and talk at all, to have meetings in the White House and those meetings basically say, we're not going to make counterproposals. To say publicly, why should I offer them anything at all? To me, I think the American people see that that is an unworkable approach. And, um, and so I would point out to my colleagues and thank the senator from Ohio in pointing out that very important fiscal decisions, very important debt-related decisions have absolutely been made in our nation's history, and I'm glad they have been made in connection with this, um, with this debate on, uh, on the national debt. So I'll yield, I'll yield back to my friend from Ohio and thank him for allowing me to intrude on his time. Uh, the gentleman, we'll, we'll, we'll hold for a moment. First, thank you for raising that uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. I had not seen it yet, so uh, I, I look forward to reading it myself. But it sounds like it is consistent with what I was pointing out, which is it only makes sense that the American people would want us to reduce spending when you extend the debt limit yet again. Uh, again, at historic levels now, uh, the American people get it. They know you can't keep spending more than you take in, so they expect us to do something on the underlying problem. The, and the uh, senator from Ohio mentioned the Budget Control Act of 2011. Uh, it wasn't a particularly... Uh, pretty way to do uh, debt reduction, but it did give us the spending levels that we're operating under now. The authors of this uh, opinion piece go on to point out that according to the Congressional Research Service, an independent arm of this government, Congress voted 53 times uh, from 1978 to 2013 to change the debt ceiling. This debt ceiling has increased to about $16 trillion, and of these 53 votes, 29 occurred in uh, Congress run by Democrats, 17 in split Congresses, and seven in Republican-controlled Congresses. It goes on to point out time and again how policy 
important policy changes were made in connection with this debate. So I thank my friend for yielding. I'd like to ask my friend from Mississippi a question. Uh, he has been a stalwart on the budget debates. He's a guy who's always held the line. He did it in the House. He's done it here. He voted for the Budget Control Act because he believed we needed to get our spending under control. Uh, he also wants to ensure that we deal with the part of the budget that's not being talked about because the whole con continuing resolution debates about 35 percent of the budget. The other 65 percent, which is the faster growing part, based on the Congressional Budget Office, parts of that, the health care entitlements, will grow at over 100 percent over the next 10 years. And I would just ask him if he's hearing what I'm hearing back home from our constituents, which is that they, they want us to do something on the spending before we extend the credit card limit again. And I wonder if he could tell us a little bit what's, what he's hearing well, back the, home, given his The distinguished today. gentleman uh, from Ohio is absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the American people are alarmed, actually, at the level of debt that this government has run up, particularly in the last four and a half to five years. It's just been astounding. We cannot continue to add debt upon debt for the next generation, many of whom are in the sound of our voices, uh, some of whom are uh, employed as our pages, and the, the uh, senator has already referred to them today. We owe them a government that grows our debt at a much slower rate, and we've done it before. When the distinguished senator and I were in the House of Representatives, we were told we could not balance the budget within 10 years. Well, actually, with the leadership of my friend from Ohio, uh, we passed legislation. We had the cooperation of the President of the United States who negotiated with us. And that government, divided government, balanced the budget not within um, 10 years, but really within three or four years, and we held that until the terrorist attacks of 2011. So yes, the American people are concerned about this. I think we would be doing a disservice to them simply to go along with a debt increase without addressing the underlying problems. And as my friend from Ohio knows, the President of the United States himself in this budget has proposed very significant changes in the growth rate of certain of our entitlement programs, which would go a long way toward getting us to a bipartisan resolution on this issue. The gentleman raises an important point, which is that larger part of the budget, the 65 percent of the budget that's not being debated as part of the continuing resolution, not subject to congressional appropriations, and the faster growing part of the budget, uh, that's an issue the President actually did address in his own budget. In fact, he laid out a number of proposals called mandatory spending reforms that would help to reduce some of the debt by reducing some of the cost increases on that 65 percent of the budget. And by the way, 65 percent today, 10 years from now, it'll be 76 percent of the budget. And the departments and agencies that are appropriated here every year is only 35 percent, soon to be reduced to 24 percent of, of the budget. And so that's a very good point you make. The president himself <laughs> has pointed out that we need to make changes here, and yet he refuses to negotiate, refuses to talk, refuses to consider any of these proposals. It doesn't seem to make sense, and it's certainly not in the interest of the American people and the people of Mississippi and the people of Ohio. So I really thank my colleague from Mississippi for coming down. I look forward to reading further the new material that he's provided for the record here today. I thank him for his leadership, and Madam Chair, I yield back my time. I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Madam President. The Senator from Iowa. I ask that the calling of the quorum be suspended. Without objection. <clears throat> Madam President, as my colleagues have done on several occasions, I come to the floor also to make remarks on the pending shutdown and the pending effort to find a compromise that we can finally get to the President of the United States. Today, specifically, to take issue with a remark made by the President on Tuesday this week regarding the health care reform bill that he also sometimes calls Obamacare. He said, and I quote, the Affordable Care Act is a law that passed the House, that passed the Senate, the Supreme Court ruled constitutional. It was a central issue in last year's election. It is settled, and it's here to stay, end of quote. Now, while I understand the President's position on the law that now is referred to by his name, he also misses the point. On Monday night, the Senate had the opportunity to keep the government running. The Senate had a bill that funded the government and did so without delaying or defunding Obamacare. And as we all know, the Senate voted down that bill. So let me repeat, the government could have been kept open without delaying or defunding Obamacare. Anyone who says anything differently is simply not being accurate. So what did the bill Monday night seek to do? The bill sought to delay the implementation of the individual mandate for a year and require executive branch appointees to go to the exchanges. Those, Madam President, are changes to Obamacare. Now, apparently, the President doesn't believe that we're allowed to make any changes whatsoever to Obamacare. I would respect that position if the President actually enforced it over the last several years, as he had bills presented to him that he signed that actually made some changes uh, in the health care reform. In fact, Congress has made numerous changes to Obamacare since it was signed into law. So I've got a list here, but it's a list that I read in its entirety so people know that the President has accepted changes to uh, his uh, uh, prime piece of legislation so that I can refute that the President isn't consistent when I go back now to his quotation, when he says the Affordable Care Act is a law that passed the House, passed the Senate, the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional, it was a central issue in last year's campaign, it is settled, and it is here to stay, end of quote. Now by that, I think the President is signifying that you can't do anything to touch uh, to touch the issue of uh, whatsoever, even to the minimal extent that we tried to Monday night. So this list was conveniently assembled, not by this senator, but by the Con Congressional Research Service, and it was done on behalf of Senator Coburn. In the 111th Congress, to start with the first change that we've made that the President accepted, H.R. 4887 clarified that health care provided under TRICARE, TRICARE for Life, and the non-appropriated fund health benefit program constitutes minimal essential health care coverage. Then we had H.R. 5014 clarify that the health care provided by the Department of Veterans Affairs constitutes, according to the health care reform bill, minimal essential health care coverage. H.R. 1586 modified the definition of average manufacturer price to include, to include inhalation, infusion, implanted, and injectable drugs that are not generally dispensed 
through a retail community pharmacy. H.R. 4994 offset the cost of the Medicare and Medicaid program extensions and the postponement of cuts in the Medicare physician payments with a change in the Affordable Care Act. But the President signed it. H.R. 4853 extended the non-refundable adoption tax credit through tax year 2012. H.R. 6523 extended TRICARE coverage to dependent adult children up to age 26 to conform with the private health insurance requirements under the Affordable Care Act. The President signed that. In the 112th Congress, H.R. 4 repealed the requirement that businesses file an information report whenever they pay a vendor more than $600 for goods in a single year. H.R. 674 modified the calculation of modified adjusted gross income to include Social Security benefits. H.R. 3630 reduced the Prevention and Public Health Fund annual appropriations over a period over a period from 2013 to 2021 by a total of six and a quarter billion dollars to help offset the cost of extending the payroll tax cut. That's a monumental change in the bill. The president signed that. H.R. 4348 modified the Medicaid disaster recovery FMAP adjustment by changing the adjustment factor and the effective date. H.R. 8 transferred 10 percent <clears throat> of the remaining unobligated consumer operated and oriented oriented plan and we call that the co-op program funds to the new co-op contingency fund and rescinded the other 90 percent of those funds and repealed the class act H.R. 1473 was another bill that the president signed it canceled two and two tenths billion of the six billion appropriation for the co-op program. H.R. 2055 rescinded four hundred million dollars of the remaining three and eight tenths billion for the co-op program, rescinded ten million of the fifteen million fiscal year 2012 appropriations for the independent pavement advisory board, instructed the secretary of health and human services to establish a website with detailed information on the allocation of monies in the Prevention and Public Health Fund and prohibited use of those funds for lobbying, publicly or propaganda purposes. That bill was signed by the President. H.R. 933 rescinded $200 million of the $500 million transfer from the Medicare Part A and Part B trust funds for the five-year community-based care transition program and rescinded 10 million dollars of the uh, independent payment advisory boards 2013 appropriation now these are changes made by congress to the law the president refers to as settled law when he talks about settled law he talks to us that the affordable care act cannot be changed now as we're debating things with the continuing resolution. So obviously, the act is not so settled that Congress cannot and has not amended it in the last several years. But as we all know, the President, through his own actions, has in addition considered o Obamacare not to be settled law either. The President has, through administrative action himself, made sumer, numerous changes to Obamacare. In February, the President delayed application of the out-of-pocket limits. In March, the President delayed implementation of the basic health plan option. Also in March, the President delayed a requirement that the small business exchanges offer a choice of plans. In July, the President delayed the exchange applicant eligibility and verification. In July, the, in perhaps the most famous example, the President delayed implementation of the employer mandate. And in regard to that, there were even members of the President's party here in the United States Senate 
that the president didn't have the legal authority to do that. So on Monday night, House Republicans sent the Senate a bill that did not defund or delay Medicare, uh, 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 delay Obamacare. It continued funding our government. It simply sought to amend Obamacare in the same way uh, dozens of times, as I just illustrated, it's been amended. There was not even any debate of the proposals on their merits. It was simply handled in the most simple way you can here, table by the Democrat leadership. Uh, and now we hear about the farcical issue of settle law. Senator's time has expired. Could I have two more minutes, please. Is there objection? Without objection. I don't know where this settled law legal theory comes from. I would note that some of my colleagues have ignored this theory during previous health care debates. In 2003, Congress passed a law, a bipartisan law, called the Medicare Modernization Act. This law passed with members of both parties supporting it. It was signed into law by the President. It survived any court challenge that were made against it. It was, by the same token, settled law. That didn't stop my colleagues from proposing legislation to amend Part D, called the Medicare Modernization Act. In fact, Democrats, including members still currently in the Senate, proposed and voted to alter the Medicare Modernization Act by striking the non-interference clause. We considered that proposal and debated it on its merits, like we should have the amendments to the Affordable Care Act recently offered. We didn't dismiss it as offensive because it sought to amend a settled law. So, Madam President, the government could be open and fully operating today, but for the Democrats' unwillingness to engage in legitimate debate over the proposals to amend Obamacare, not defend it or delay it. We are where we are because the majority refuses to give the American people relief from the individual mandate and treat President Obama and his political appointees the same as all other Americans are by going to the exchange. In the wash of words that we will hear on the floor, I hope that this simple truth can be heard. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from New Mexico. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Recently there was a disturbing poll in the Washington Post. It said that most Americans fear that the American dream is passing them by. Almost 65% worry they cannot make ends meet with their current incomes. And that is up 48% from 1971. And we're not talking about luxuries here, just basic living expenses, food and clothing for their kids, a roof over their family's head, just getting by day to day. So many of our fellow citizens are working harder than ever and still feel like they're falling behind. And they wonder, where is the country headed? This week, they're wondering more than ever, watching the spectacle here in Washington, watching the government shut down, grinding to a halt. I'm hearing from my constituents and from people in New Mexico and they're frustrated and worried. They're concerned about the United States Department of Agriculture crop payments as we head into the harvest when they need the financing the most. They're concerned about being able to close on mortgages with federal backing, with their loans on hold. Many New Mexicans are going to be furloughed without pay. This hurts their families and all the businesses that rely on them in our economy restaurants, retailers, car washes, landscapers, any type of business you can imagine. This shutdown did not have to happen. We are not debating the amount of the budget. The fact is House Republicans are demanding concessions just for keeping the lights on at the federal government. I think most Americans really have two questions here. How did we get into this mess and how do we get out of it? We are coming out of the worst recession since the Great Depression, but recovery is underway. We've seen 42 months of private sector job growth, 
That's 7.5 million jobs. That's hope for millions of families. We've had nine consecutive quarters of economic growth, the longest stretch since the recession hit in 2008. So we're slowly making our way back, not fast enough, with too many folks still struggling and with great challenges for the future. This is a time for leadership, for working together. Americans expect their leaders to act like grown-ups, but they feel like they're watching a schoolyard spat. Is it any wonder they hold Congress in such contempt, or that they worry about the kind of country they will leave to their children? Here's what we should be doing. We should have a farm bill by now. We should have comprehensive immigration reform, and we should have a serious budget, one that would get rid of sequestrations, meat cleaver cuts with targeted spending reductions, tackling the deficit, reforming the tax code, helping the middle class and small businesses, helping families and seniors who are struggling, moving ahead with smart investments in infrastructure, creating jobs, investing in our future. The Senate passed that budget six months ago, but the House went in a completely different direction. Their budget put tax cuts for the richest Americans above funding for education and ensuring the safety of our roads and bridges. Democrats and Republicans have differences. That's no surprise, but we still have a job to do. We still need to sit down and work it out but a minority in the House has blocked our way forward. Not once, not twice, but time and time again. American families and businesses need a long-term budget. Businesses do not hire on a monthly basis. They need certainty and the confidence that their government is working to create an environment for growth. We are giving them neither. Instead, we lurch from crisis to crisis. The worst thing about it is it doesn't have to be this way. This is a manufactured crisis, a series of self-inflicted wounds to our economy. The American people do not want this. They want a strong economy, they want jobs, and a government that can actually get something done for the middle class, not just for Wall Street billionaires. The American people want a government that works, not a government shutdown. There's no logic behind this crisis. Why are we here? Because the other side wants to kill the Affordable Care Act. I respect the diversity of views, the diversity of views in America and in Congress, but the Affordable Care Act passed Congress like every other bill. It passed the House, it passed the Senate, and the President signed it. If Republicans want to repeal this law, they should make their case to the American people and work to pass their own health care law. What's happening here is unprecedented, disruptive, and undemocratic behavior. We heard a lot of indignation, hour after hour of it. But here's the thing, it doesn't stop the Affordable Care Act. This whole stunt has been a colossal waste of time, and wasting time is something we can't afford. The real problems facing our nation are still waiting. Everyone outside of a radical group of obstructionists knows that this is silly, knows this is misguided and dangerous to our economy. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, Business leaders from coast to coast, there is a loud chorus of stop, this is enough. But so far, it isn't loud enough. The Affordable Care Act isn't perfect. I'm not going to come here to the floor and say the Affordable Care Act is perfect. What law is? But it is the law of the land. It's being implemented. Shutting down the government doesn't change that. Here's what a shutdown does do. 27,000 federal employees in my state could be furloughed and lose their income. Nearly half of the civilian workers for the Department of Defense will be sent home. In New Mexico, that's over 6,500 people who helped defend this country and may not be paid. 
Social security applications could be jeopardized. Calls to SSA for help could go unanswered. Federal loans would be delayed for tens of thousands of folks trying to buy a home or applying for a small business loan. Those doors may be locked. National parks will close, so will museums and monuments. This hurts the tourist economy in my state and hurts small businesses. During the last shutdown, seven million tourists were turned away. Our veterans who already face too many delays in their claims for benefits could face even more. During the last shutdown, more than 400,000 veterans saw their disability and pension claims delayed. Students will also be hurt. Work study and Perkins loans payments would stop. Pregnant women and mothers who need nutrition assistance for their children may not get it. So all of this because the other side wants to send a message on Obamacare. Well, it has a very high price, costing our nation billions of dollars every day and deferring federal agencies, including our critical national labs like Los Alamos and Sandia, from their important national security missions. Wall Street is on edge, Main Street is on edge, families are worried, communities suffer, and there is another cost. The paralysis of government sends a terrible message, a terrible message of failure and dysfunction. What's next? The debt ceiling. Holding the credit of the United States of America hostage for political gain. Instead of serious debate, we have ultimatums. Instead of regular order, we have midnight shutdowns. Instead of compromise, we have all or nothing. Take it or leave it. My friend in New Mexico, Master Sergeant Jesse Baca, summed it up well in an interview with KOB-TV back home. He said, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated because of the way we've always been taught to work to get things done. You work together, and that just doesn't seem to happen. Settle your differences. Jesse's right. We need to start working together. We have not done that, and so here we are on the wrong train, on the wrong track, going nowhere. It's hurting families, hurting communities. It could derail our economy with a recovery still underway. The hardworking families of this country want a government that works, not one that shuts down just to send a message. And meanwhile, those families wait, wait for us to meet the real challenges that face our nation and that make a real difference in their lives and the lives of their children. Madam President, before I finish, I want to just discuss the subcommittee that I chair on appropriations, the Financial Services and General Government Subcommittee. Because we work with agencies that are critical to keeping the economy running smoothly, I have to speak up and make sure that those who are causing this shutdown know exactly how badly the country needs the government to reopen. This shutdown is jeopardizing consumer safety. It's adding to the uncertainty facing our financial markets. It's doing real damage on our economy. Our subcommittee funds the Small Business Administration, and small business owners are really going to take a hit in this shutdown. The SBA, the Small Business Administration, is closed. I don't worry about my colleagues, but the top concern I hear from small business owners in New Mexico is how hard it is to get a loan to expand. The SBA proves an average of $86 million in loans to small businesses each day. But while the government has shut down, our nation's job creators aren't getting those resources. If the shutdown continues, 28 million small businesses will no longer be able to get capital from the SBA to expand. And there are other impacts, too. Each day the government is closed, our economy grinds down a little further. The shutdown is affecting the services that keep our capital markets safe. The CFTC, Com Commodity Futures Trading Commission, 
will have just 4% of its normal staff during the shutdown. That means that Marketsville will be without effective oversight. We're about to hit the debt ceiling, our nation's borrowing limit. It's a potentially dangerous financial situation, and the shutdown has put our watchdogs at the CFTC and the SEC to sleep. Global markets are open, Wall Street is open, but investor protection agencies are closed. It's an open invitation to financial abuse. The shutdown is also putting the safety of our children at risk. Christmas may seem far away, but companies are already working to get ready for the holiday season. They're shipping goods in from overseas, including millions of toys. During this shutdown, only 22 employees at the Consumer Product Safety Commission will be available nationwide. That's 22 people to inspect millions of imported toys and gifts, gifts that American families will be putting under the Christmas tree. These agencies were created by Congress to protect American investors and consumers to help small businesses. It is a travesty the Tea Party Republicans in the House have been allowed to hold the country hostage. Madam President, that's unconscionable. Real people are being hurt by this. The people who are going without pay, without veterans benefits or survivor benefits, without important financial and consumer protections. And you know the one that's the most devastating to me, people who are going without food. And there we're talking about millions of women and children in this country in poverty. So with that, Madam Chair, I would, uh, I would yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Thank you. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Madam President. The Majority Leader. I should now consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. Madam President, it's been seven days since we passed a piece of legislation to fund the government. I wonder how many days it will be before the Speaker makes the American people wait to open their government. How long is he going to make them wait before government's open? It's a real hardship on not, not only the hundreds of thousands of federal employees, but the people who depend on the federal employees for their own jobs. So it's very unfortunate. Madam President, we have not had a harder working senator uh, the past nine months than the presiding officer. You have worked so hard doing so many different things, not the least of which presiding over the Senate. And you've presided over the Senate early morning hours, late night hours. I mean, it's remarkable, and I, I so appreciate uh, your doing this. Uh, the entire Senate, all Democrats and Republicans, express their appreciation through me to the presiding officer for the good work that you do in making this place work better by doing it. Not only do you preside, but you do a good job. Dignified, you do it with authority. The people of Wisconsin are so fortunate to have the distinguished presiding officer as a senator. I've had um, good fortune, sir, with a number of other senators from Wisconsin. Russ Feingold was such a good friend. I miss him so very, very much. Herb Cole, unique individual that added a great deal to the Senate and the many things that he did uh, as a longtime member of the Appropriations Committee and the other things he did. However, none of the senators uh, who served from, that I've served with Wisconsin will outshine the distinguished surprising officer. You've been remarkably good. I, this has been, you've only been here just a short period of time, but in the short time you've been here, you've had admirable dedication to this institution. You're a native of Wisconsin, the first woman ever to represent that great state. And the, as frequently as you've presided, you've enjoyed a front row seat on the history that's being made to this um, congressional session. Some of the stuff you've watched has meant too much fun, but it's been good that you've uh, done such a remarkably good job. So I, through, on behalf of all the senators, congratulate you for your accomplishment and thank you for your service to the Senate. This is the first Golden Gavel Award and that there will be a formal presentation made at our caucus this Tuesday to recognize your distinction. Um, this is uh, something that's traditional, the Golden Gavel, and it's a beautiful, uh, Memento that we will make that we will make we will present to you on Tuesday. I ask unanimous consent the Commerce Committee be discharged from further action on HR 1848.